What's up, you guys? Welcome back to another lecture for statistical methods. We are getting into the final couple of chapters here. And uh, we finished up uh, last time the two sample test, hypothesis test. So uh, we're going to get into basically multi sample hypothesis testing. We're going to see if uh, basically like multiple populations have different means. So that's kind of the goal for today. I'll see if anybody has any questions before we get started. I uh, finished up the grading. I was done with most of the grading Friday and then finished it up yesterday. And then uh, posted the grades on Moodle today. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you've seen that. Let me, let me uh, know if you have any questions. I'm going to get started. We're going to look at basically multiple populations that have uh, their own parameters. So that's like the left scenario. So basically multiple populations. And we take a sample from each population and say, is there a statistically significant difference between the means of those populations? So multiple populations more than just two All right we know how to do a single population we know how to do uh, two populations but now many populations three four etc Uh, Will Francis asks, is in the uh, paired hypothesis testing, is there any situation where you would not use a t-test? Uh, if you had a large number of pairs, then you could probably do a z-test instead of a t-test. So if you had like more than 40 pairs, uh, you could do a, a z-test. Good question. Um, but I'm just going to give you a small number, you know, to do a t-test with. So don't worry about doing a large uh, sample size on that because I'll probably have you calculate D bar and um, S for that sample. So it'll be like a small sample size that you can, a small number of pairs that you can uh, calculate those yourself. And then get the T and then get the, you know, P value and all that stuff. Good question. That's a really good question. So yeah. Uh, we're doing that because we only have like X bar and S. If we had sigma and if we knew anything about the distribution, we might could do a normal distribution, but we don't really know anything about the distribution. We have small sample size. We only know S. So we'll do a t test. Um, well, I guess we do kind of have to assume it's normal. At least the difference is normal. But uh, yeah, we'll assume small sample. It'll be a small sample size, so you'll just do a t test because you only have S. I might try to write up a flow chart um, at some point of, you know, when to do Z, when to do T, etc. Great question. Okay, so multiple populations versus multiple treatments. So the second way we could think of this is multiple, multiple treatments. We have one population, we're going to apply different treatments to that population. Is there any difference in the mean of those treatments based on the samples that we gave the treatments to. So is there a statistically significant difference in drug A versus all the other drugs? Or really the question is, is there any statistically significant difference in the means of, you know, maybe the recovery times or whatever it is that we're looking at? Okay, cool, cool. So. Um, that's kind of the goal for today is basically like scaling up hy hypothesis testing for means to be m many samples, multiple samples, several samples, more than two. So how do we tell if there's a statistically significant difference in the means, either in the multiple populations or in the treatments? It doesn't have to be treatment, but we we'll use treatment because it's an easy thing to understand. All right, um, let's see. Definitions here, these are going to be super important to really understand what's going on. So I, the first definition right here, I, capital I, is the number of populations or treatments, depending on what scenario you're looking at, 
um, to be compared. <clears throat> so capital I, that's going to be something we need later. It's part of our degrees of freedom that we'll need later. Capital I is the number of populations or treatments. Mu1 is the mean of population 1. Mu2 is the pop mean of population 2, etc. Or the true average response or whatever. <clears throat> Mu i is the mean of the last population. And then uh, the hypothesis test. So here is our hypothesis test. And this is always our null and our alternative. So hypothesis test. And I remember back when we were doing hypothesis testing was how do you choose the alternative? Well, here for the single factor ANOVA, we are just going to always assume this is our null and this is our alternative. And the null is that all the means are the same. right? We assume all the populations are the same, or we assume all the treatments affect each other, or affect the, the population the same. The alternative is at least two are different from each other. Okay, that's the alternative. At least two of the mu's are different from each other. So you could have maybe just one is different from the rest or all of them are different, but we don't know. We're just going to say at least two of the means are different. And then from the data, it usually kind of suggests, you know, if it's only one, you can kind of tell which one it is, but we won't say like specifically which population it is, but you can kind of tell from the data usually. But then you want to say, okay, is that difference statistically significant or not? Okay, let's look at um, some things that we're going to do here. This is just some example data here. Uh, let's see, this is just a compression strength of different types of boxes. So we have different types of boxes. We have four different types of boxes. One, two, three, four. And we have a uh, sample, so this is 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 6. So we have six boxes, so six of each type of box. So that's basically what this is saying, is we have six sample points for each type of box. Okay. And the compression strength uh, for the first box and the first sample, or for the first uh, type of box, was 655.5 in pounds. And then the second box in the first sample, or the first type, was 788.3. The next one was 734.3. And this is all in pounds. And then I get the mean of the first type of box. So I call that X1 bar. So that's the first mean. That's x1 bar. And there's going to be a special notation we use for that in just a minute, but just, just uh, be aware. That's the first mean. And here's the first sample standard deviation. So we call it like s1 maybe, the first sample standard deviation. OK, now, looking at this data and looking at these means right here, it kind of appears to us that the fourth one, x4 bar, is significant. We can't say it's significantly different, but it looks different. It looks different to us. And if we do a box plot of each, uh, each population or each type of box, here's the first type of box. So this is box type down here, box type. And it's like a box plot for the different types of boxes. The first box has a mean right around 713. The second box has a mean right around 756. 0.93, um, next one 698.07, and then here's where I say it's kind of like obvious. This one's 562.02. So these three at the top, the top left, one, two, and three, uh, they don't really look different. You know, like they, it's just kind of random that they're different, but they may all be the same. However, the fourth box does look significantly different. So now we want to test basically whether or not that is a significantly different uh, value. Is it statistically significant? However, it could be that, you know, four is different from the rest, but also maybe two is different because it seems to be higher. So maybe two is different from the one and three as well. So four and two would definitely be different. Two and three might definitely be different, but we can't say that for sure. We might do some more testing to see if the two-way Hypothesis test is uh, significant.
anyway, that's kind of the idea. So you get the X bar for each one. So it's like your X bar one, X bar two. And this right here is called the grand mean. It's like your, it's just like your grand X bar. It's the X bar. If you were to take all of these values in the data and divide by 24, you would get uh, this grand mean. So it's all of the data added together and divide by 24. So add all the data together and divide by 24. Or add the X bars together and divide by four. It's the same thing. But we'll have some more like uh, official definitions for that grand mean and these X bars and all that stuff. But just to get you an idea of what's going on or what this might look like in the, uh, in the real world, what the data might come in as. So uh, some more notation that we want to go over. Uh, Xij denotes the jth measurement from the ith population. So basically i is over here and j is up here. So let's say x25, they kind of write x25 right there. Go to the second population, the fifth point is right here, 732.1. Uh, so that is the second population, fifth measurement. So that's the actual value, xij, or x25. Cool, cool, cool. So that's, uh, that's important because we'll, we'll, we'll use this notation all throughout the day. We're going to have a lot of subscript notation, and it's really important to keep them straight, you know, which one means what. Uh, we assume that uh, sample sizes are equal and denoted by j. So j equals 6 in the previous example. So this is the number of measurements. Number of measurements in each population. So that is the capital J, and that's also going to be something that we need to keep straight because we're going to use that as a different type of degree of freedom when we get to calculating our p-value. So we need our capital I and our capital J uh, kind of tucked away, and we need to remember what they are. Uh, the populations are normal with equal standard deviations. That's a big assumption to make. So these are two assumptions. We have same sample size for every population, but we also assume that all the populations have the same standard deviation. So that's a big assumption. Big assumption. But we'll go with it for now. Uh, the expected value of xij, so the ith population basically, is mu i. So it's the mean of population i. Mean of the ith population. And the variance or the standard deviation of any population is just sigma. Okay, now. Um, the thing I really want you to focus on is equality of sigmas. The way we check that to basically see if we can use ANOVA is we look at the sample standard deviations, SI. If the largest SI is at most two times the smallest, you can assume equality. So that's going to be our check for basically whether or not we can assume or we can use ANOVA. Also, each uh, population needs to be normally distributed, but we'll just go with that. So if you're doing this in practice, you would do probability plots, normality, check to see do the percentiles match up. Um, we kind of glossed over that. but. Second thing you would check is if the largest sample standard deviation is at most two times the smallest sample standard deviation, then you can assume that they're equal. Now, single factor analysis of variance. Uh, this notation, this is what I was trying to say earlier, is we don't just use xi bar, we use xi bar with the little dot. Basically, that's to say that j is not being filled in. It's for all j values, so we're actually doing a summation over j. So a summation over j and divide by j, which is the number of points in the data for that population. 
And then we calculate this for each population. So this part right here means we do this, do this average for each population. And that's kind of how we got that column that was like the mean column. So this means do this averaging for each population. So if you, if you remember, we had that column. It was like x1 bar, x2 bar, x3 bar. We just summed over all the j values from 1 to 6 and divided by 6 to get the mean for each population. So that's the sample mean of each group right there, x bar i dot. The dot means j is being summed over. Now the grand mean is x bar dot dot right here, x bar dot dot. That means you sum over i and j. So you have a sum over i and j. That just means you sum over all the data points and divide by, in our example it was 24 because that's 6 times 4, which is how many data points we have. So it's the total number of data points right here. Total number of data points. in all populations. Since all the populations have the same number, it's just i times j total data points. Okay, cool, cool. Now the sample variances for each population, um, we calculate them just like we normally would. We do that data point, so data point minus the corresponding mean squared over sample size minus one. So let's just say data point minus corresponding mean. Data point minus corresponding mean. So that population, population's mean squared over number of sample points in the population. minus one. And that's just our sample variance uh, calculation. Now it's the same calculation we've always done, we just have an extra subscript to worry about because we have to denote, okay, which population are we talking about? And i is that population. j is being summed over in that we're just taking all the data points in that population and summing over them, just like we normally would for if we had a single sample and we were calculating the sample variance that way. Okay, now the idea is if all the population means are the same, basically the null is true, then the sample means would be close to each other and to the grand mean. So we have to look at two things. What is the distance between the group means? That's number one. The second thing, what is the distance from the group means to the grand mean? So this is kind of the, the variation aspect that we're looking at in this analysis of variance. What's the distance between the groups and then what's the distance between the means and the grand mean or the overall data? So um, we have some more terms here that we need to define before we can get, uh, get an actual example. Uh, the first one is called the mean square for treatment. MSTR, and the formula you really need to latch on to is this one over here. So this is MSTR. It's the mean square for treatments. It's the difference between the means. It's like the variance in the means from the grand mean. So kind of like the variance. So I should say kind of the variance. of the means from the grand mean. <clears throat> the mean square for error is basically just like an average of the variances of your population. So mean square for error, MSE, is just like an average of your variances. 
So it's kind of like the average variance. So average variance. Move that down. Average variance. Now, and well, it's kind of premature to say, but the test statistic then is MSTR divided by MSE. So it's like the variance of the means from the grand mean versus the average variance overall. And this is our test statistic. We'll have to look it up. Um, we call it capital F because it comes from something called the F distribution. So this test statistic, MSTR divided by MSE, has an F distribution with a certain number of degrees of freedom. There's actually two sets of degrees of freedom, or two degrees of freedom. Two, two types of degrees of freedom, I should say. So when H0 is true, the expected value of MSTR equals the expected value of MSE, which is the variance of the original population, or populations, because they all have the same, pop same variance. Uh, another, let's see, See, I don't think I want to. Yeah, I don't want to spend too much too much time on this slide. Let's go to some more terminology here. So, I can skip most of this slide. Okay, single factor analysis of variance. Now, the total sum of squares SST. The total sum of squares, SST, is just sum up all the data points and figure out how far away are they from the mean, the grand mean. So don't forget this is the grand mean. And this is the all data points. X, I, J, because we're summing over I and J. Now, this is actually two things added together. We call SSTR and SSE. So it's actually this SSTR plus SSE. And so this is square sum of error within the groups, and this is square sum of treatments between groups. So it's like the X bar for that group minus the grand mean. So it's like the variance of the um, means away from the grand mean versus the variance of the data points away from each um, each x bar and that gets you the uh, square sum of or total sum of squares so really what you need to focus on is sstr and sse and then you just add those together to get sst mstr then can be calculated as sstr divided by i minus one MSE can then be calculated by SSE divided by I times J minus 1. SST corresponds to the total variance in the observed data. So then our test statistic is actually calculated this way. Probably a little easier to do this than it is to do the original MSTR MSE formulas. So um, small f, H0 is more probable than the alternative. Um, we'll look at the actual table, how we get the p-values to kind of know. We still have a level of significance we have to compare to, so it's pretty much the same. Um, we just have a, quite, a, quite a bit more to understand as far as developing the test statistic. So any questions so far? I just want to take a, take a second and see if there are any questions. Okay, sweet. All right. The test procedure. 
now what do we do with all of this information? There's just so many terms floating around. You're going to have to take some time, read through the terms again, really try to figure out if you understand what they are kind of saying a little bit, but at least know how to calculate them at the very least. But of course, we don't just want to have some kind of surface level understanding. We want to really dig in, make sure you understand kind of what each term does. Now, the test procedure is if H0 is true, then F follows the F distribution with first degree of freedom population size or number of populations minus one. So number, number of populations minus one. The second parameter, V2 or nu2, is the other set of degrees of freedom. It's number of populations times number of samples minus one. So there's two different sets of degrees of freedom, or two different degrees of freedom we have to look at, V1 and V2. The p-value is estimated from a table. We'll see it in an example in a minute. Um, but it's a very extensive table. It's very, uh, it's very involved. Many pages to it because there are two degrees of freedom. So you have to be pretty careful in how we read this table. But once you read it, once you get the hang of it, it's really not a big deal. Also, I'll show you how to do this in, uh, in Excel maybe at some point, but really doing it by hand is really what we're going to focus on. That's really where understanding comes, doing this stuff by hand, at least to start out. So the p-value is the area under the curve to the right of the f-value. And if that p-value is less than a significance level, we'll reject the null. If it's not less than the significance level, we will fail to reject the null, just like we normally do. So if p-value less than alpha, reject H0. Else, fail to reject H0. Okay, so it's the same thing. It's just how you get the p-value is much more involved because you have to get the, the F statistic. How do you get the F statistic? Well, you have to do SST and SSTR, all this mess. But once you get the hang of it, you fill out a table. I'm going to show you the table. We have to fill out this table. And then we're going to get our F statistic. Then we can look it up in our chart to find the p-value. Once we find the p-value, then we can compare it to alpha, reject the null, fail to reject the null. All right, this example, it's the same one we started out with earlier. All the data was in the table earlier. So what do we have here? We have four boxes, so our population size is four. For each population, we have six measurements or six data points, so J is six. What are we going to do? We're going to calculate all of these things. MSTR, which is SSTR over I minus one. Um, I kind of sidestep that here, but calculate SSTR. The square sum of treatments, and we get four thousand, no forty-two thousand four hundred fifty-five point eight six. Calculate the MSE. Um, well, we went ahead and calculated S1 to SI in our table, so we go ahead and get in the MSE right here directly. It's just the average variance. Take the ratio. We get our F statistic, 25.09. Now, what do we have? We have degrees of freedom V1 right here and V2 right here. So we have to go to our chart. V1 is always on the left, and V2 is always... Sorry, v, V1 is always up top, V2 is always on the left. And we want to look at where is our uh, p-value. So how do we read this chart? We go to the degrees of freedom up top, V1. Go to the column with 3, so it's this column. Look on the left, go to the degrees of freedom, V2 is 20. Now I'm in this range. I'm looking at these values, and I say, okay. My value is 25.09. My test statistic is 25.09. Here's my test statistic. Well, it looks like the larger we go, 
the smaller the p-value. So here's p over here. These are p-values. The larger our test statistic is, the smaller the p-value. So since 25.09 is greater than 8.01, or sorry, 8.10, our p-value is going to be less than 0 0.001 because that's the smallest p-value we have in this little section. So each section is broken up into four p-values. Now, if I had like five as my f statistic, it would be between these two, and I could say my p-value is somewhere between 0.1 and 0.01. So we get the p-value here is definitely less than 0.001. Now, did we have, yeah, tested alpha equals 0.05. So this is less than, 0.05, which is alpha, so we would reject the null. So there is definitely one mean or one population or one treatment or whatever. I guess it's like one type of box that has a mean that is significantly different from the other means. That's what we can say for this data. There is a statistically significant difference in the means. And we could then say, okay, it's probably the fourth one. Then you could kind of go individually and say, okay, fourth, compare it to each population, do a two sample test maybe, see if it's the one that's statistically different. But this one tells you, yes, there is a statistically significant difference. You may want to do further testing to figure out which one it is. All right, square sum notation. Now, there's an easier way to calculate these SST, SSTR, and SSE, and these are the ones you really want to remember. SST. So these are the easier formula. Let's calculate SST this way, calculate SSTR this way. SSTR, and then SSE. What did we say? We said SST was SSTR plus SSE. So SST was equal to SSTR plus SSE. So actually, we could calculate SSE as SST minus SSTR. So just calculate two and you can always get the third. Okay, question, there was a question, does little f not play into the table? Um, what we're saying is yes, it does. How? It's right here. We're using the fact that little f is larger than the value in our table. So little f is larger than the largest value in this little section. So this little section is all we're looking at. Okay, and our little f is larger than the largest value in this little section. Okay? Because f is larger than 8.10, its p-value, the p-value corresponding to our little f, is smaller than 0 0.01, which is the p-value corresponding to 8.10. So we can say confidently that our p-value has to be less than 0 0.001. So we can confidently say, we can know for certain that as the f-values get larger, the p-values get smaller. 
That is a that's a tough question. Um, what if the p value, or sorry, what if the alpha is within the p value range? So like, well, that's a good question. But usually we give you one of these um, four p values anyway, right? Point one or point oh five or point oh one. 0 0.0001. I guess the only thing would be something like 0 0.005. But uh, yeah, that's a pretty significant level already. So 0 0.0005. So that's less than 1% already. But yeah, I'd, if it's less than that, you have to get more specific. You can't use this table. You have to use like the actual F distribution um, calculation which Excel can do, but uh, we're not gonna go into that by hand. So good question, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna explore that by hand. I think what we would say if that were to happen on an exam or something like that, we would just say um, not enough information, fail to reject the null. Like there's not, you can't say whether P is larger than alpha or less than alpha, uh, but they are close. They're within the same range or the same little interval. Both alpha and p may be between 0 0.05 and 0 0.01 or something like that. Good question. Uh, there is a way to get around it using the like actual F distribution, not just this table, but again, we're not gonna do that on an exam or something like that, so. Okay, now, like I said, over here, um, x double dot here is just gonna be the sum of all values, and x i dot is gonna be the sum of all values within a certain population or certain group, okay? Then we can calculate SST as this formula, you know, this first formula here, SSTR we can calculate this way, and then SSE is probably best calculated as SST minus SSTR. So that's probably the best way to calculate SSE. Or calculate SSE and SSTR to get SST. Uh, it just depends on you know which two you want to pick. So but usually we just calculate two and get the third. this formula over here. So that's kind of the idea. Um, we always fill out this thing called an ANOVA table, and this is going to help you uh, remember what to do and how to fill it out and what to put there. So treatments, um, we're going to put degrees of freedom. We have a column for degrees of freedom. So degrees of freedom. So we have a column for our degrees of freedom. The treatments uh, degrees of freedom is I minus one. The error degrees of freedom, I times J minus one. And then the total number of degrees of freedom if you were to add those together. Basically, this is saying add these together. You will get I times J minus one. But this is basically V1 and this is V2. Okay, then calculate SSTR, SSE, add them together, get SST. Then calculate MSTR using this formula and MSE using this formula. Then take their ratio to get the F statistic. Once you have the F statistic, you have, go to get the p-value, get p-value. And that's pretty much the approach you need to take whenever you're doing this uh, ANOVA test. Fill out the ANOVA table by filling in the degrees of freedom, V1, V2, and then the sum, and then SSTR, SSE, and then the sum, and then MSTR, MSE, and then the ratio to get the F statistic. So that's the approach or the kind of the steps you want to take when you're doing ANOVA. You want to fill out this ANOVA table. Okay, cool, cool. Let's look at another example. Uh, we have three different types of fabric. 
and we want to look at uh, treatments. I guess it's like cleaning, you could say cleaning the fabric somehow. Um, treatment one, we get these values in the first row. So this is treatment one. You get these values, treatment two, you get these values in treatment three, you get these values. <coughs> now the sum, this is just the sum of the row, right? This uh, xi dot is just the sum of the row. This is the average of the row, x, xi bar dot or x bar i dot, it's the average of the row. And here is the grand total. If you add all the data points together, x dot dot. So we have three groups. We have five values in each group or five samples in each group. We will test whether or not the means are the same at a level of significance 0 0.01. So let's basically fill in our ANOVA table. But degrees of freedom, that's easy. We have I equals three and J equals five. So we can go ahead and fill in the degrees of freedom. So for the treatment, it's I minus one, which is three minus one, which is two. Error is i times j minus 1, which is 3, times 5 minus 1, which is 3 times 4, which is 12. Add those together, you get 14. But all we really need is v1, whoops, v1, and v2. Now we calculate SST and SSE and SSTR. Uh, here we calculated SST, which is actually the total already. And that fills in as 0 0.4309. And we calculate SSTR, which is 0 0.0608. And SSE, then, is the subtraction, you know, this formula right here. SSE, then, is 0 0.3701. And now, to get the MSTR, what do we do? We do SSTR divided by, J, um, divided by I minus one. So SSTR, which is 0 0.0608 divided by two. And then MSE, which is SSE over 12 basically, so 0 0.3701 over 12. And then, let's see, I'll just get those really fast. That is 0 0.0608 divided by 2, which is 0 0.0304, and 0 0.3701 divided by 12, which is 0 0.030842. And now what do we do? We do MSTR divided by MSC. So 0 0.0304 divided by that last thing. I got 0 0.9856. So it's really 0 0.9856, which I went ahead and rounded to 0 0.99. So we fill in this ANOVA table, we have our test statistic, we have our degrees of freedom, we go to the table and look up V1 equals two. So this is the V1, right, V1, V2, so V1 equals two, and V2 equals 12, and we compare our test statistic to that little set of data. So our test statistic is way up here, way up here at the top. So 0 0.99 is less than 2.81, which implies our p-value is greater than 0 0.1, which is greater than 0 0.05, which is alpha. So accept H0, uh, we should really say fail to reject. 
fail to reject H0. So you're going to want to go through, fill in this chart, calculate your p-value by looking at the F distribution table. Questions so far? We'll look at another example, but questions so far. Okay, cool, cool. So, we'll look at another example. Oh no, okay, there we go. Have some data, <laughs> getting really vague here. We don't really care about the application, I guess. Uh, the number of groups or populations is five, and then we have nine data points for each group. And then we give you the ANOVA table um, we're going to test at this alpha level here, 0.05. We fill in the ANOVA table. Um, so 5 minus 1 is 4. So 5 minus 1. And then 5 times 9 minus 1 is 40. Add those together. Calculate these. This is the SSTR and then SSE. Whoops, SST. SSE, um, probably calculate SSTR and SST and subtract to get SSE. And then this one is actually 1520 divided by 40. And this one is 624 divided by four. And then this one is 156 over 38. So it's kind of like you use the previous column to get the next one. Yes, yes, okay. Uh, what I may do is go back and look at those SSTR and SST calculations in more, more in depth, um, if that helps. So uh, here we have our F statistic, 4.11. Here's our degree of freedom, V1, V2, 4, and 40. Now we calculate our p-value based on our table. So let's look in our table. Got our degrees of freedom, V1 is 4, V2 is 40. So here's our column, V1. Here's our section, V2. So we're gonna stay in this range right here. And our value is actually between these two. So 3.83 less than F less than 5.70. So what can we say? We can say the p-value is somewhere between here and here. So our p-value is somewhere between 0 0.01 and 0 0.001. And this is kind of like to Derek's point or question. Our p-value is somewhere in between here. So what are we testing at? We're testing at 0 0.05. So our p-value is definitely less than 0 0.05 because it's somewhere in here. So our, our p-value is somewhere between 0.1. Whoa, wrote those the wrong way, huh? Should put the 0, 1 there and the 0, 1 here. So our p-value is definitely less than 0 0.05, which is alpha, which means we can reject the null. 
So let me go back to the other example and look at the SSTR, SST calculation maybe a little bit more slowly. I'll pause for a second before we do that though. So let's go back to that previous example, the SSTR and the SST calculation. So this X double dot right here, don't forget X double dot, is just the sum of all the data points. So you sum over I, one to capital I, sum over J, it's one to capital J, X, I, J. So that's this x double dot term. Okay. So I'm just using the formula that we had earlier for SST. Then you square all the terms and then add them together. So that's what this is saying. Square all the terms right here. Square them all and then add them together. Minus 1 over uh, 3 times 5, so that's 1 over i times j, right, this is i times j, times the square of all the terms added together. That's the square of all the terms added together, which is x double dot squared. And we get this value, 0 0.4309. SSTR, though, xi dot, don't forget, is the sum over j from 1 to capital J, X, I, J. So if you sum over that row, it's the total for the ith row. And that's that X, I dot. X double dot, again, same thing from here. And we get this value for SSTR. And then we take the difference to get SSE right here. Sorry, I blew through that one a little quickly. Again, it's really just knowing the notation and um, being able to do the summation. And really, it's a bunch of calculator work. This chapter is going to be a really good chapter to, to have your notes, you know, and your book. Because uh, this is a lot of formulas to remember. So again, we don't, we have open book, open notes. So this is where it's going to like get you out of a bind. You don't have to memorize all these formulas, but you kind of need to be a little bit familiar with how to work with them and how to, uh, how to do those summations pretty quickly on a calculator. So get some practice calculating these things on your calculator. But that's the extent of your work, is really just getting these summation values and knowing where to put the square. Do I square it, then add it, or do I add them all, then square it? Well, you have to figure that out. But um, x double dot is adding them all together, and then you see x double dot gets squared, so it's like you're adding them all together, then squaring it. So it's just kind of playing around and trying to figure out how to do it on your, on your calculator uh, pretty efficiently. Because you're going to need to be pretty efficient for the last exam the final part two so and this is going to be one problem out of seven or eight or however many we're going to have on that exam so but yeah that's uh that's pretty much the ANOVA table that's how you do it uh, you want to fill it out get your p-value looking at the f distribution table uh, we're not going to look at this more complicated stuff like in practice um, but there are other things we could do um, 
let's say if the groups were with were different with respect to one thing, there was only re one reasonable way to define various groups. What if there are multiple ways to make groups? Okay, maybe uh, you have treatment, but how does it you know affect male and female? And what's the difference between uh, the effects? So now you have multiple groups. So you, before you were just saying, okay, how does the treatment affect the population? Now you might say, how does it affect different parts of the population? So, um, let's see, might apply the treatment to the same person over multiple days. So it's just a bunch of different things you could consider with treatment and multiple populations and things like that. So uh, we're going to stick to the single factor ANOVA. There's only one kind of way to measure the uh, difference in populations. And so we're going to stick stick to uh, what we talked about today. But there are other types uh, as you go further into your statistical career. If you do that, um, you'll see all of those. Any questions? Okay, cool, Leo. Well, that wraps up chapter 10. Um, you're just going to really have to be really good with the, uh, the ANOVA table, trying to figure out how to put the pieces in there, what goes in there, and then remembering how to get the SSTR, SST, and then SSE, and then take the fractions, and then do the ratio, and do all that stuff. So filling in the ANOVA table is kind of the big thing here. Let me try to at least show you how to do this in Excel. If I can... Uh, Remember how to do it. I need to pull in some of the data though. So let me pull in the data from one of our examples and then uh, look at this in Excel. So let me pull that up. worksheet here. Let me pull up the data from earlier. Um, let's do the one where we had the 25, you know, like what's the actual p-value for that, that data where that was 25. So let me, let me take this over here, put this over here, and let me put the data in. Let's see if I can't remember if the columns need to be, we'll figure it out. 